Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Paul Sweeney. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. In PIMCO, in Newport Beach, I mean, in the old days, were Bill and Mohammed down at the wedge surfing? Well, I see Mohammed across the hall. Uh, on television <laughs> really? right now. Donnie, I'm excited. All those oh, it's too I'll much. have to say It's like a Pimco Nexus here. <laughs> well, right com- now. Do you well, guys surf out at Pimco I, on lunch I can't break? swim. Uh, I have a place in the, in the Caribbean. I have a place in the Caribbean, Turks and Caicos, and I have to wear a life jacket anytime the water's above 5 foot 11. My no. height. <laughs> I cannot You're swim. You're from Staten Island. Well, look, we, we, it's a concrete it's jungle. Any, anyone from New York's in a, Lisa, in a concrete in here jungle. Come on. It's all concrete. <laughs> I learned to swim in a four foot above ground pool that's 12 feet long, so I really couldn't. <laughs> okay. Paul, save us. Ask a bond question. Let's go to the bonds here. I mean, for the longest time, we had no interest in talking to the PIMCO people. Interest rates were at zero. Now we can, can't even get a phone call returned because the everybody root? wants to talk about bonds here. Tony, we've got real interest rates out there. There is some significant uh, carry here for a lot of people. What's kind of the 30,000 foot view from your perspective at PIMCO? What are you telling clients to do with their fixed income investments? Well, it's like a nirvana for an active bond manager. It's like a global bond buffet. <laughs> There's so much to do. Right. It, ha- it hasn't been a global bond market in a long time because, as you said, interest rates were low. And they were low everywhere in yeah. the 2010s, near zero, pin near zero. So there wasn't much to do. Now there's so many things moving around like butterflies. You simply take your net, try to find the good ones, and put them in your collection. Uh, so we'd say that um, drop lower your fears and anxieties. Uh, first, I'd say there's three things not to do. One, don't try to time the market. Yields are high. They look very good historically, very good versus expected inflation in the twos and versus what's typical volatility. So I'd say, generally speaking, you want to be enamored by the bond market opportunities today and lock in today's interest rates. It's total return time. It's time to think about something beyond the yield, potential price gains, and that's what total return strategies are and that could be and and i don't mean a fund but i mean the idea of potential gains in prices is what you want and to to put those yields higher the returns higher so where do i go tony i mean i can just go right outside right now and get a two-year treasury at 4.8 percent do i do that or do i go out and maybe take some more credit risk here how are you guys thinking about well uh intermediate maturities are probably the sweet spot and the bloomberg aggregate which is a compilation of lots of bonds it's sort of uh it's a market cap weighted index has about 40 percent u.s treasuries 25 percent agency mortgage-backed securities and 25 percent corporate bonds the the average maturity on that or duration in fancy bond language lingo <laughs> is around six seven years now the okay. I, I often call those maturities especially the five year the long bond of the short end and if you think <laughs> the federal reserve is going to be lowering yeah, yeah. short-term interest rates the two-year of course will rally but not as much as the five-year will right. and so that'll really get moving when the fed does my chart of the year right now i haven't decided yet I and mean, somebody gave it to me thank you out on twitter i'm stealing it from you is the yield to worst, the old Lehman Barclays, now Bloomberg Index, the global yield to worst. Tony, it's out seven standard deviations off the Volcker Great Moderation. We've had this shift in the bond market. Do we recover to some form of trend of the Great Moderation? Or are we, are we resetting a new vector? Well, the for bond total market return? thinks it's a new vector, uh, looking at SOFR futures, what do you think? overnight futures. I think. The likelihood is that interest rates, the, the, the 2010s is the wrong analog for thinking about the future, meaning that it's more likely that we go uh, back to the yields of past, the past, uh, than we do uh, the t- 2010s. But not as high as the market's price. The market thinks the Fed won't lower its policy and rate less than four to the rest of the decade. To close barely the loop, less than four. the real solution here, which is iconic in your book, Folks, it's 1,200 pages. Only Lisa Mateo's read it. Um, Tony, the, the, the loop here is the x-axis solves everything. Time will heal the return to wherever that yield vector is Yes, in fact, uh, 
the 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 <coughs> simple idea is that uh, the, the the stated yield is of course uh, the likely uh, return. So if you see on the Bloomberg aggregate five and an eighth five percent, that's likely to be your return over five years. The starting yield is the major determinant of your future returns. There are things that could happen, could sprinkle in some alpha and such, but that's the likely story. And given the now here's really the the, the most important thing to think about: price stability and the Fed credibility the ability to knock the inflation rate down. If you think it's going to get the inflation rate into the twos, a yield of five, historically, relative to that, is very good. Now, remember what Chair Powell said recently. He was asked, would you be satisfied with inflation at 3%? He said you shouldn't use the word satisfied and 3% in the same sentence. (laughs) And you should believe, and here's the adage, don't fight the Fed. Don't fight the Fed means believing in its eventual success. It will be able to right. get the inflation rate below 3% yes. and keep it below. And it is already for the gauge of ch- You're, you're a bond targets. guy. We don't care. What's <laughs> Tiffany Wilding think? Does she think we're going to get to 2.xx like Clarida? Uh, they, uh, the economics team does. And I give you one really strong reason to think this. And I was reading back at Irving Fisher, 1933, Dead what? Deflation Theory of Depression. Irving Fisher. Irving this is Fisher. not Stanley Fisher. Yeah, no. This is Irving, Irving Fisher. Fisher. Oh, trying, to, trying to understand the Great Depression. The key is uh, loan growth. In the end, banks are factories. They make money. They're the only entities that can. Private credit entities slosh money around that was already in the system. And loan growth in the United States since the, mar- the bank stress of 2023, right. really meager, 2%. In Europe, flat to negative for the past year and a half. You can't have strong spending right. in the long run with no with the factories not printing money. I got I got 30 seconds. Can you put Phil Knight into this or Chicago? If we could quote Irving <laughs> Fisher, can we get Knight or Schumpeter into this? Just do it, I guess. Okay. Invest in bonds. Uh, lock in these shields. Don't get, get stuck lessons? in cash. Can we get you Please, swimming Please, someone help me. I can't. I do the doggy paddles within seconds of reaching six Lisa foot of water. Lisa took me from a beginner to an advanced intermediate it's horrible. Red it's Cross so embarrassing. swimmer. It was great. I wear a life jacket six feet out in the water. It's crazy. <laughs> we got we to work on it. Anthony Cosenzi, thank you so much. Thank you. He's with PIMCO. Smart stuff there on Yield. And we'll get Tiffany Wilding on to straighten out the PIMCO dialogue. Now is our most important interview of the day. Stop what you're doing, and we're going to do this very carefully. Linza Piegza works for Stiefel Outlier. Uh, I'm kidding. That's an economic (laughs) firm out in the Midwest. And Lindsay has staked the ground that this is a Fed that's going to be higher for longer and even raise rates. Lindsay, an update in your research notes at Stiefel. Do you still believe that Jerome Powell will need to raise interest rates? I think right now, looking at the inflationary environment, it's clear that inflation is very sticky and will likely remain noticeably above the 2% target for quite some time. Now, the committee should take that as an indication that they stopped short of a sufficiently restrictive level and take further action, meaning re-engage in rate hikes. But Tom, I'm not confident that they will. Yeah. Listening to the latest message, it feels as if they'd rather remain on the sidelines, keeping this current elevated level of rates in place and wait for the improvement to happen more organically. The real rate, the 10 year real rates, what I use, Lindsay, I'm sure you've got stuff better than me, 2.08 percent uh, right now. It didn't move all that much off this inflation nirvana of the last 10 days. What, where are the tip points? Where's the, the bracket, if you will, around the real rate that will force the Fed's hand? That, that's a good question because we didn't see much movement, even with the, the market cheering that cooler than expected CPI number. And given the fact that I don't see inflation moving much, in fact, nominal rates, I, I think, are pretty much range bound at this point. It's difficult to say what the threshold of pressure will be on the Fed, because the Fed has been very clear that they're focused on policy easing. So unless we saw a material backup in inflation, and I don't mean one tenth of a percentage point, it would probably be in the range of half a percentage point, if not more, only then would the Fed really feel as if they're backed up into a corner to take further action to re-engage. They're, they're going to fight that prospect 
as much as possible as it forces them to admit a second policy error on the back end mm. after a first round policy error of holding crisis level accommodation in place well past it was appropriate, waiting at those low levels till March of 22. Lindsay, if the Fed does stay kind of consistent here at these levels in terms of the rates, is that going to be enough to slow down inflation? Will that be perhaps enough to push this economy into maybe a recession, which will certainly take care of inflation? Well, I, I do think that at these rates, we're going to continue to lose momentum. We've already seen the economy slow from 5% to 3%, let's call it at year end, to sub 2% at the start of the year. But quarter to quarter volatility aside, I do expect the U.S. economy to remain in positive territory for 2024 bouncing around a two-ish percent pace. That's not enough to bring down inflation in and of itself. But that being said, momentum is waning. Consumers are feeling pressure. Businesses are feeling the weight of higher costs, higher borrowing costs. Now, at this point, consumers are still spending. Businesses are still investing. But again, it's that second derivative decline. It's that loss of momentum. So the bigger question is, where do we go as we turn the calendar page into 2025? And if we continue to see this loss of momentum with growth slowing to maybe a non-accelerating pace or, or at least falling below the bare minimum that you would expect for a developed economy, well, at that point, if the Fed is still tolerating above target inflation, my bigger concern is not, not a recession or a downturn, but a period of stagflation, mm. slow growth, elevated prices, that's going to make it very difficult for the Fed to stimulate the economy and get us back onto a longer term trajectory of prosperity, given this conundrum of low growth, high inflation that really leaves traditional monetary policy metrics uh, less than less than robust in terms right. of their impact on, on, on uh, the economy. Hey, Lindsay, this week we also got a, a weaker than expected retail sales number. Some folks are telling me, don't worry about it. We had some uh, good sales numbers out of Walmart yesterday. What's your take on this consumer? Well, certainly exacerbating the market's optimism for near-term rate cuts was that softer than expected consumer spending report because the prospect of slower inflation is certainly more convincing when domestic demand appears to be slowing in tandem. But I, I'm not necessarily convinced that that's what we're seeing, a material slowdown in the consumer, as the annual pace still remains very solid. So yes, month-to-month -month volatility we are seeing as consumers right. shift the goods and services in their basket, but on an annual basis, 3% is still indicative of a very solid, right. resilient consumer. I, I agree with you completely. Lindsay, a really important question. If we get a pigs of market and inflation <laughs> is sticky and we have a two-part America, do the haves, the people with assets, do they benefit or are they harmed by difficult inflation? No, I think we continue to see a growing divide between the asset holders and the non-asset holders, because as long as the market continues to anticipate the Fed eventually cutting rates, the, 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 the market eventually uh, focused on this, this easing policy, that's going to continue to fuel these asset valuations in terms of the equity markets. And then from a housing market standpoint, which is the other sizable component of growing the, these asset valuations, well, th that comes down to a simple supply and demand. And we came into this housing market cycle at a multi-year deficit. So just by the nature of household formation, population growth, massive flows of immigration, it's likely that we continue to see <laughs> housing demand outpace supply, keeping prices elevated. And again, perpetuating that divide between asset holders and non-asset holders. Lindsay, thank you so much. Just brilliant. Lindsay Pegs, congratulations. I can't say enough, folks. Sir Paul, along with a guy named Jackson, invented modern publishing, and he was determined. His show, and Mike Bloomberg was a huge participant in the show at the National Gallery in London, and it's now in Brooklyn. Right sure, now, you can go Brooklyn. see Paul McCartney, 1965 black and white photographs. The original, they have the original copy of I Want to Hold Your Hand. But Paul McCartney changed how musicians worldwide get paid single-handedly did that with a guy named Michael Jackson at ATV Music uh, years ago. Sony uh, ATV Music. 
Yeah, Sony ATV Music. That was Mr. Jackson. They own the known world as we know it. Uh, this is a joy. Lucas Shaw darkens the door. We never speak to him because he's in L.A. and gets in at 3 a.m., you know, the whole thing. And I, I, Paul and I are, are really interested in, like, the death of Hollywood and that. And yesterday, I got a big hug from Michael McCarty over at Michael's, who's iconic in California cuisine, and it's where you go when you're beautiful. I was supposed to go with Gura today. I know. You know, Gura, got Gura's got to be. Got I mean, there were Jumana the other day, Jumana Bertucci. Yep. Michael's is old Hollywood. Is old Hollywood gone? Is there anybody darkening the door at McCarty's place anymore? In Los Angeles, uh, I would say that the, there was a there was a generation of chefs that sort of typified Hollywood in the '80s, right? Michael McCarty, Wolfgang Puck, those people. Yeah. Their restaurants are still open. They're still vibrant. They definitely appeal to an older clientele. I don't think that if you were to Lisa wouldn't go. You know, you know. Uh, if you were to if you were to talk to the people running some of the studios or maybe the new stars, because the fact is, is most of the people running the studios in Hollywood are the Michaels demographic. I mean, that's one of the complaints in the business right now is that Hollywood is being run by people in their 60s and 70s, and there are not a lot of opportunities for people in their 30s and 40s to have a chance to make some changes. Right. We've been talking about Mr. Ripley, and, you know, within your magnificent nose, folks, Lucas Shaw owns a high ground Sunday. When's it come out? Sunday? Uh, Sunday, 3 p.m. Pacific. Do you have your interns type it or, you know, how's that work? I write every word. Okay. We've been talking about, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Stephen Zalian and Mr. Ripley. Yeah. He did Schindler's List. He's done all this stuff. Legendary screenwriter. Tell us about that person in the new Hollywood that we see dying when you look at the stock prices. Well, if you think about that show, and I think I'm getting this right, that show was initially set up at Showtime. And then when Paramount basically killed Showtime or folded it into Paramount Plus, that the the new boss of of Paramount Plus with Showtime, Chris McCarthy, who's now the co-CEO of Paramount, I think decided it wasn't the best fit for what they were trying to do strategically. Look, black and white, period piece, I get it. it. It doesn't scream commercial. And Netflix, which has more money than almost anyone else to take some risks and pick things up, swooped in and took it. Um, look, I don't think that shows a huge hit for them. Um, but it certainly is uh, beloved artistically, and we'll see if it gets a bunch of Emmy nominations when those come out over the summer. So, Lucas, one of the things Tom and I talk about a lot is just kind of where we go here going forward from the media industry perspective. The business, I grew up in the media business, everybody made money. Everybody made money. Now those economics are really up for grabs Very here. challenged, yeah. And do you think the traditional media companies in Hollywood, you live there, you're seeing it every day. Are they prepared to make that pivot? I'm thinking Paramount. I'm thinking Warner Brothers Discovery. What's the feeling in Hollywood, in, in L.A. about that? Um, I mean, look, the, the mood is is pretty dour at the moment because you see the, the, the word for a year or two now has been sort of efficiency and economy and trying mm-hmm. to cut back and save money, right? You just had Bob Iger come out earlier this week at an investor conference and say, we spent too much money launching Disney+. Plus." Now, I think that's up for debate. They, they probably spent a, an appropriate amount of money, but there's no question that you had a lot of companies, especially the traditional ones, that were seeing their cable networks shrivel. And so they spent all this money on streaming and they haven't been able to make it a profitable business and they didn't necessarily have the right approach. And so now every Everyone's pulling back and everyone's scared about that because it's much, much, much harder to get a project made than it used to be. Let's talk just about Paramount. That's the, the number one. Yeah, what happens years, this weekend, Lucas Shaw? You are in. I keep telling Tom, five years ago, I could have sold that company with three phone calls. Now you can't give it away. Well, I, we will probably have an update on that later this morning. Oh, that we I will. Cannot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, no one's listening, Lucas. But, the, 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 uh, <laughs> but you're correct that, look, it's not the most attractive business for people, right? You know, you it, it has, it's the way it still makes all of its money, for the most part, is these cable networks that are getting smaller every year. It has a streaming business that's growing but doesn't make any money, and it has one of the weaker right. film and television studios around. And so, the, you know, you've got David Ellison, who has a lot of money, and his father, his, his father. His father has a lot of money. He's now built a, a decent-sized media business. He wants to buy it, I think, partially because it would make Skydance much bigger and build mm-hmm. him a studio, but also because right. there's legacy there. Mm-hmm. Most of the other folks who'd be interested, you'd, yeah, you'd be buying it almost because you like 
Yeah, the history of Paramount, not because it's a great business. And the crushing lack of time that we have because you refuse to get up at 3 a.m. <laughs> Lucas Shaw, does Tim Cook want to be in Hollywood? Does Jesse of Amazon want to be in Hollywood? Does, does Satya up north there in Washington, <laughs> do those tech people really want to play the Michaels lunch game? I think it depends on how you define Hollywood. So Satya Nadella and Microsoft, they're in entertainment, right? They're one of the biggest video game companies in the world. I don't think they're especially interested in the film and television business, sort of classic Hollywood. Amazon is in it. You know, they have a, I don't know that they're going to invest at the same level as Netflix, but, you know, they have a bunch of sports rights. They're spending billions of dollars on programming. Their prime video business is one of the largest in the world. Apple is sort of the big question mark. They have invested right. a bunch of money, but I don't think they're right. they're going to go buy a studio. Paul's upset. Is Christmas NFL football un-American? Why? They have Christmas NBA basketball. Right. Uh, that's right. That's competitive. <laughs> so what happens here um, with sports? I mean, Netflix, they're starting to go into sports. Yep. I mean, I, I, one could argue that the future of sports revenue and this value of the, all these franchises and all these big contracts it's going to be paid out of Silicon Valley, not Hollywood. Well, right now, the leagues are sort of have the best of both worlds, right? There was a while in, in scripted entertainment where you had broadcast and cable networks and streaming services and just all this money being right. spent. And that's sort of where we are with sports yeah. right now. You look at the NFL, they're in business with CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, Amazon, YouTube, and Netflix. That's right. a pretty amazing. good place to be. Well, what about the, the venue sports? The the venue sports that just came out? Oh, the the They the just stream, announced the it yesterday. Studio. The name, yeah. I'm pretty skeptical yeah. of that business. <laughs> One last question. We are a walking experiment of YouTube and YouTube TV, what we're doing here at Bloomberg Surveillance yeah. on YouTube right now. Sounds What's the up. power of YouTube combined with YouTube TV five years forward? Are we going to have jobs in five years? Yeah, because you're, you're, you're living proof that YouTube is a powerful it's medium. stunning. YouTube we're is the biggest media, media company in the world. Yep. Um, and the most powerful one. They're listening. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube TV is also going to probably become the biggest pay TV distributor in this country in the next five years. So, yeah, I think you're you're in good hands if you're in business with YouTube. Is it monetizing for Google? Like, are they minting money on it every day? I don't know that it's profitable because they spend a fortune on it. They yeah, only break given Lisa. They only break they out the Lisa revenue. Lisa Chanel dress yesterday. <laughs> you missed but it. revenue wise, yeah. YouTube's bigger than Netflix. You combine advertising and subscription, it's a massive business. Just not as profitable. Okay, so Paramount, we should pay attention this morning. Is that what it is? It will be an incremental update, but it will okay. be an update. Oh, incremental. And did you go to the upfronts this week? I went to a few of them, yes. Okay. Lucas Still Shaw <laughs> with Mark Gurman. All I can say, folks, is yep. we have a series of newsletters Set out. Your Begin alerts. with Lucas Shaw and Mark Gurman on Apple. I just can't say enough about the legit expertise. He's writing it. He's got four interns from Pepperdine. One, one, of them, one of them is a surf stud, and they're writing that puppy up, getting it out Saturday or Sunday. Lucas Shaw, thank you for the visit. She's got 77 papers at her desk. It's stacked up. You can barely see Lisa at 5 a.m., Putting this together, your daily look at the front pages. Lisa, what do you got? Okay, you're going to like this one. Cassette tapes making a comeback oh, in the music said, business. Here we go. Yes, okay. I still have my collection. Those in the music business, they say the majority is not the older generation, but it's the younger generation. Okay. Because shows like Stranger Things, Guardians and the Galaxy, <laughs> that feature cassettes like in their shows and movies, that's sparking that younger generation. Taylor Swift. She sold 21,500 cassettes from her latest release. But you have Billie Eilish, Dua Lipa, uh, Kendrick Lamar. They're all going to cassettes. But who has cassette players these but days? That's the thing, finding the cassette <laughs> player. But the reason why, I'm like, so what's the thing? So artists are saying that lower production costs, okay, new releases on vinyl can cost about 35 cassettes, as low as $10. But they're also saying cassette sales had a bigger impact on chart position. I'm not sure how that plays out. I mean, I get the vinyl yeah. thing. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'd rather listen to Tidal or something incredibly beautifully done digital, particularly through tubes. But I get vinyl. Paul, remember the celebration when we got rid of cassettes? Well, 
how, going from eight track to cassettes. Well, was, Tucker. That was evolution. Yeah, Tucker's still using eight track. <laughs> but eight tracks to cassettes was like unbelievable technological leap. Yeah. Oh, um, the size, yeah. And then and cassettes then Dolby to C, CDs. Dolby D, Dolby S, Dolby Dolby Dolby. And the I answer just, is it sucked. Oh, I just hated when you had when it came out and then you had to take your pencil yes. and like go like this. Exactly. And, like, so if I go to Bro- if I go to Brooklyn this week and there's going to be somebody in a two hundred dollar plaid shirt, David Gurr. telling me I need to buy cassettes. Yep. You got to buy. Yep. Gura does this. Back. I know he does. I think it's a big take coming up. He's our guy. Lo-fi with yep. David Gura. <laughs> Next. Um, when you go to the airport, here's the thing. And you do you bring your car? Do you take an Uber or driver? What do you what do you I saw, do? I, I, Never I, once have I driven to the airport really? in my professional life. Oh, okay. Did I read that? Is Why your story you? that it's like it's packed? The parking is packed. People can't find spots. There's Why almost they missing flights. Well, I know when we go, sometimes we'll bring our car because if you factor in, we need the extra large, you know, Uber, and then to go back and forth. Let's say we're going to JFK or somewhere really far, it's going to cost us ridiculous. But it's cheaper to take the daily rate and leave your car. Really, I, I'm surprised then, by that. And then you can, you know, kind of leave at your will you know you, you can just to... kind of go all we right. do it like the outside of the airport parking so it's a little bit even right. cheaper than the actual i always wondered who parking. did that but now that would be now the now Mateo family. so what's Mateo the outcome are they, gonna, are they gonna raise the price or build more parking so they're spots? trying to build more parking that's one of the things the airports they're also working to install these guidance systems that help direct you to <clears> open <throat> spots so that people don't right. wind up missing their flights because that's the problem. And then Memorial Day's around the corner, so they're trying to put out this warning to people like, hey, you know, you better book your th- spot ahead of time, which you can also do. I just do. don't get it. I had no idea. That's why I learned God every time taxi she's on. cabs and Ubers so you don't have no. to do this stuff. Not I mean, I had no JFK. idea Lisa Mateo was surfing <laughs> Who in the JFK? Pacific. You live five miles from Newark. Because you have your points on Southwest, which don't no, fly out no, of Newark. No. You get your points on United, dude. I know. You live in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, I wonder if Charlie Pellet's surveillance Europe on $5 oh, a day a, corresponded. That's a good question. Yep. I wonder what that's Pellet thinks question. about yeah, the We'll, we'll get his opinion. Okay. Um, TikTok is testing out 60 minute videos for its app. So that's going to put it in competition with YouTube. Oh. So that's the thing that they're working on now. Um, it's a big thing because longer video uploads means more competition for a lot of the streaming services but it's not clear when or when this is going to happen it's kind of in this testing out phase this is from business insider so it'll be interesting to see because you know we did we've heard so much about youtube and how you know it's at the top of of streaming but now if tiktok starts putting out these 60 minute videos will that start to put it in competition with the other streaming services. I, I don't know why they I, wouldn't, I don't actually. Right. I don't know why they wouldn't, because the advertising dollars are out there. Well, first of all, as you mentioned from that data we saw from Nielsen earlier this week, mm-hmm. YouTube is the second uh, most visited video source uh, in the marketplace after uh, the Walt Disney Company and all right. their channels. So people are really spending a ton of time on YouTube, and yeah. YouTube's selling advertising against that audience. Um, I think TikTok, assuming it can stay in its current ownership, would think about doing the same. Wow. Would okay. surveillance have to go on TikTok? Oh, we could do that. Yeah, look, it's, I not know it's not going to happen. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. Take a note, Rich. Ain't going to happen. No, Next. No, he's on it. Let's move on. Okay. We talked about this yesterday because I was wearing this dress when I walked in, and you commented on Tom. You said, Well, everybody was commenting. Everybody commented on it. You know, it's it's like got it at TJ Maxx. It. You know, she's out of Harper's Bazaar. It's I know. All I know. It. So the Wall Street Journal actually put out a story about this whole thing, how TJ X halls are becoming this badge of honor. Best. I mean, you have people like yeah. Bethany Frankel. You know, she's going to TJ Maxx in there looking for these different things. And we're talking Valentino, Coach, Goose. So how, does, like, how does a Valentino I'm product get the TJX? They it it doesn't sell in, in Bloomingdale's. Right. And then it would go to TJX maybe They're the next... usually the, the older model. I was going to say, like, the next season, the next if season, it doesn't sell you know, in Bloomingdale's... Exactly. Go, okay. Exactly. Okay. So, that's so that's why, why you can I got sport... my Calvin Klein dress for $30. That is amazing. I mean, when <laughs> Calvin Klein is designing that... Is this in the Lisa Mateo hour? <laughs> exactly. Does Calvin Klein think Lisa Mateo is going to be wearing my dress at $30? This started in Boston, and, and I have the clear memory of TJ Maxx being different. Hmm. And they've become ever more different, like you say. And... Uh, the, the pros, Dana Telsey, Joe Feldman, Oliver Chen, and others, uh, Robert Burke, who's, who's, who's ginormous within retail consulting, they will tell you there's always been a halo around TJ Maxx. I, I don't understand it. I think I was in one when Nixon was president. But, you know, <laughs> I, uh, all I know is the pros say they're different. Thomas like is a big it. company. It's got a $112 yeah. billion dollar market cap. 
It's up 5% this year, the stock is. It's yeah. up 27% over the past year. So yeah. it's done well in a tough retail. Yeah, you got one more? That, it's Marshalls, it's Home Goods, yeah. all of them are all, all TJX. Yeah. You so. got one more? No. I'm you not. going to Costco I'm this going, weekend? No, I'm going to TJ Maxx. You're going <laughs> yes. to TJ Maxx this <laughs> weekend? Yes. I'll post some pictures for you. <laughs> oh, I, I, th- I, I think Valentino, but you know, actually, I sort of see Celine. You know, I could see Lisa, you know, yep. rock, rock and Celine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, like TJ Maxx, I didn't know. I Lisa Mateo, <laughs> Lisa Mateo in charge of the newspapers on this uh, Friday. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show weekday mornings from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.